talk about microRNAs. Uh, the, 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 the background, so microRNAs. So microRNAs is an abundant class of small regulatory RNAs, just about 21, 22 to times long. When I say they're abundant, what I mean is there's roughly on the order about the, the same number of microRNA molecules in a um, mammalian cell as roughly is about the total methanol. So they're um, then over a thousand unique microRNA sequences have been identified in the human genome, which means the total number of flavor of microRNAs that the human code is roughly equal to or greater than the total number of transcription factors, or, or in a greater than the total number of um, G protein coupled receptors. So it's a major class of rates. But what's, what's fascinating is, is that computational predictions clearly show that more than half of the protein coding messages in a um, million transcriptome encode at least one evolutionary conserved uh, binding site for a microbe. Right. So I should say a microRNA is they regulate post transcription so they back directly off them. And so there's this growing list of um, conserved microRNAs that are being found to be critical components of diverse um, cellular and physiological properties um, in mammals and in, in all animals and, and plants as well. Okay, so at this point in time, a lot is known about how microRNAs are made. So they, they're born as these long transcripts generally that can fold up into a local structured um, primary transcript and the recognition of this hair of this hairpin structure leads to a series of um, nuclear cleavage events that ultimately result in the loading of a mature uh, microRNA, single stranded 22 or 21 nucleotide RNA, into a member of the Argonaut protein family. So Argonaut, so it's this complex here, Argonaut bound to microRNA. This is the actual biologically active form of the microRNA. And the way the complex works is Argonaut uses the sequence information encoded in the microRNA to identify complementary sites in message RNAs that are targeted for repression just through normal Watson Crick placement. <coughs> and then once Argonaut um, finds the targeted message RNA, it parks there, and then that promotes repression of the message by blocking translation as well as um, the, the degradation. So uh, I've worked a lot on these steps. A lot's known about the details of these steps, different parts. But today, I'm just going to talk about this part right here. Uh, just, just the question of once Argonaut has its, its microRNA, this guide on it, how does it then find uh, the target, its target site, the matching site? It's a question I've been interested in a long time. And then I'll talk a little bit about more ongoing stuff that's still developing, about what happens after Argonaut finds its target line. But the search process itself is something I've been interested in for a long time. Uh, and it's, I think it's an interesting question but, uh, for, for a couple of different reasons. The first reason is, it turns out that although base pair interactions are what mediates um, the, the search, so base pair between the, the microRNA and the message RNA, the target message RNA, you don't need to have perfect complement parity. You don't need base pairing throughout the microRNA. And in fact, some nucleotides of microRNA are far more important for making stable interactions with the target than others. So for example, nucleotide 1, the fiber in the microRNA, doesn't seem to be involved at all recognize the target line. And in contrast, um, nucleotides 2 through 8, which has been termed the seed region, is the most important region, the most evolutionary conserved um, types of um, microRNA target sites. In, in fact, most, so the majority of microRNA target sites found work primarily just through this, um, just through these eight, seven base pairs. And then after that, what's strange is um, pairing the 9, 10, 11, and 12 is almost never seen. Now, there are, in some cases, about 5 to 10% of the microRNA target sites that have been looked at very carefully, um, complementary to nucleotides 13 through 16. Um, so this is in terms of supplementary site, because the in of itself doesn't seem to do much. Having complementary here by itself doesn't do anything, but it can supplement repression that seems to be initiated first by the seed region, but why that is um, And so, so one level of um, interest, point after 16, these they're there, but they don't seem to contribute at all to recognizing them in general. Um, so there's these peculiar base pair interactions um, and requirements. The, the, so the first level, I think, is interesting. But the second level is it, it's even more basic, and that's just what is the mechanism of the search itself. And so taking a, the, the simplest situation, we just have these seven nucleotides, the microRNA paired to its target RNA here, and you can look at it in a more slightly more um, realistic um, like this, so here's the four three-dimensional models of microRNA shown here in red, and then um, it's base pairing with just those seven nucleotides, 
of the target RNA, which is shown here in blue. Now, it turns out that most microRNA target sites are found in the three prime untranslated region of, of message RNA. See, yeah. And so, that if you look at Wikipedia, the, um, the median length for mammalian three prime UTR is 700 nucleotides. So, for scale, that would look like this. So, there's the microRNA here, and it has to then bound to this be a typical um, three prime UTR. So the microRNA has to be able to find these seven base pairs. So um, they establish these seven base pairs along this um, polymer. But of course, it has to be able to do this. It's not working in a vacuum. It, it has to be able to also avoid the non-targets. So um, basically, say this this uh, this is the true target. This is a non-target um, three prime into our message RNA. Now, if you do the math, um, if you do the probability of having a seven out of seven match. If you just took seven nucleotides. Um, and you ask, what's the probability of all of them seven matching the seed region of any microRNA? It's about 1 in 15,000. So this is only 700 base pairs. So odds are any random message RNA aren't gonna, it's not going to match the seed of, of, of any microRNA. However, if you allow even a single mismatch somewhere in the seed region, the probability goes down to about 1 in 700. So odds are any, any given message RNA you look at will have a close match to the seed region of any given microRNA. So, right, now if you go one step further and you say, what if I allow two mismatches? The probability is about 1 in 50. And so both of these message RNAs, the, the target and non-target, are covered in these close match sites. And the only real difference is this matches 6 out of 7, while this matches 7 out of 7. And somehow the microRNA has to be able to tell the difference and while avoiding all, the, all this huge factor. So the only way that this search process could ever happen on a physiological relevant time scale, of course, is that the search is mediated by the argument. And so to really understand how the search happens, you have to understand the interaction between argonauts, the microRNA, and the target. And so that's what we set out. So we, um, we, uh, so we started by just asking the question, what does the argonaut look like? So we um, grew crystals of first just argonaut bound to the microRNA. And so this is pictures of the crystals. Um, for not crystallographers, I put this in. This is actually my students for these crystals. And this is one of her hairs. So that's just for scale. So we can see this out. might have a friend that worked on deeper fish and he thought this crystals were like things that we actually held in our hand. <laughs> right, so we grew the crystals and we saw the structure using the standard techniques, and then this is the structure here. So okay. So this is how it works. So um argonaut protein is shown here in the driven diagram, and this is the microRNA running here in red. Um, and so argonaut proteins have these four globular domains with these very esoteric things. Um, there's the mid domain, and the PV domain, the PAS domain, and the end domain. And the way that it works is the domains are arranged such that there's basically two lobes here and here. And with this central cleft, and the, the micron it runs almost almost in a linear fashion between the two lobes. So the five prime end is found here in the mid domain, and the three prime end is found up here in the PAS domain. And so actually, you can learn a lot um, just from this structure just by looking at how Argonaut holds the microRNA in the absence of target line. So it shows they zoom in here. We'll look at the five prime end first. So here's nucleotide one, which we know is never involved in recognizing target sites. And you can see why now. Nucleotide one, um, this is the, the, the base here, is flipped into this pocket in the mid domain making, to make contact. So it's not available for making base pair interaction. It actually wasn't a surprise because um, crystal structures of um, bacterial argonaut protein or prokaryotic from David Barker and Dijon Patel show a similar attitude. Now in contrast, um, nucleotides two through seven, which makes up most of the CPU, are stacked up against each other. So all the all the bases are stacked up against each other and the lots of bases are pointing out towards the solvent. So these should be available for base pairing. So most of them are, but it turns out, this comes back later, this alpha helix here this is helix 7, and this is the seventh alpha helix in the primary sequence of R. It actually blocks, um, spherically blocks access to nucleotides um, 6 and 7, and nucleotide 8 is actually disordered. So you, I can show this better if I move to the surface one. So you look, the surface view, what you can see is, in the seed region, just nucleotides 2, 3, 4, and 5 are, are exposed, or 5 actually a little bit dodgy, but it, it, we'll, we'll say it's exposed right now. And this actually, you can look at the structure of this, this idea holds true, it holds through. So, okay, we zoom back out, and now we look at the three prime half, a little bit here, disordered in the middle. But we can see um, all the way from 12 up to 21. And so what happens is this half of the microRNA is threaded through this 
narrow channel between the path domain here and the end domain here. It's probably easier to go back to the surface surface. So you can see it sort of threaded through here. And I think probably the most important idea that comes out of this is that if you look at it, um, there's a no uh, interaction with the protein maybe it's such that in no case you have two adjacent um, bases stacked up against each other. And so what that means is interactions with Argonaut basically totally uh, prevent, at least in this confirmation, the ability of this entire stretch of the RNA to make you know, base pair interactions with a complementary target messenger. And so when you take it all together, what that means is that although Argonaut has this microRNA with 21 nucleotides that it can use to find target RNAs, in this confirmation, only four are actually available for, for base pairs, making base pairs um, contacts, and the rest are tied up inside the protein. And so we've crystallized, and we've others crystallized, several different um, structures of Argonaut from humans and yeast and, and different crystal forms, and we always see this is true. That this, this seems to be the, the, the unifying thing. Only these four are. Right, okay, so that's nice. So then, of course, you want to know what happens when it does bind to the protein. And so then we went back and we determined um, a bunch of crystal structures of um, Argonaut bound to, to target RNA, so it's a ternary RNA. Most of the target RNA structures that we've been looking at so far have been these short little um, RNAs are just complementary to the seed region here. And we've done a lot of different structures with a lot of different things. Um, I'm just going to sort of summarize the main ideas that came out of uh, these structures. And so if you look at a side-by-side -side comparison, this is a structure I just showed you, the, um, the binary complex Argonaut microRNA, and then this is the ternary complex, Argonaut microRNA, and then target. And so the target RNA is this um, yellow part right here. Um, and so what's nice, when you have two, two structures of the same molecule, you can um, then interpolate between the two, and that actually is actually the best way to, um, to get a sense of the range of conformational differences between the two. So that's what I'm going to do. Interpolate between these two structures to, to show you how um, I think it works. So it's just starting with the protein alone. So this is, um, this is before the target RNA binds. If you interpolate to the target bound structure, you can see basically this part moves. So it's, it's a very simple movement with the hinge right here that runs through this beta strip, this beta sheet, and it just basically pretty much is a rigid body movement of the path, which results in an opening of the semi here. Now, if you do this, um, if you look at the microRNA, you see the a much more sort of dramatic rearrangement. And so what you can see is this whole part here does a, a major rearrangement, um, three prime half. There's also this nucleotide here, the, the very um, deep three prime nucleotide. It doesn't actually change confirmation, but for some reason the program makes it to a full 360 uh, flip, and I, I can't make it not do that. So it looks a lot more dramatic here than it is. But after about three hours, I just gave up. And, uh, <laughs> but, all right, so, so this part is definitely doing a major rearrangement. But if you look here in the C region, you can see it's also sort of expanding, and, and it's actually moving towards A form um, in between two confirmations. And so I'm going to start by zooming in here first, because that's where the target arm lies. All right, so zooming in, just to orient you, you know, this is the, uh, the three, five by minutes, so that one's here, and the two, three, four, and five are pointed out and are exposed to target pairing, and the six and seven are currently included by helix seven. And so I can take, I can dock onto the structure, the target RNA, so I have that structure, and you can see there's perfect, there's plenty of space for, for, the, for two, three, and four, no problem, even five, you can do it. Uh, but then this RNA is going to write into helix seven. And so I'll do now is I'll interpolate to the actual structure where the target RNA is found. We see Helix 7 moves out of the way, and it actually releases constraints that the helix seems to be placing on the sort of second half of the seed region. So you see um, it'll go up, and this thing comes up, and then the rest of the seed region becomes ordered. And now you can see there's space here for the, for the rest of the target RNA divide, and there you go. So if, so I, when I saw this, I went, yes, okay, that's totally what we predicted, of course. The new helix 7 has got to move out of the way because you, know, you can't have two atoms in the same place at the same time. So it wasn't a surprise, really, to see. But what was a surprise, what was really nice, is where Helix 7 goes after it moves out of the way. It turns out, if you look, this Helix 7 now lies in the minor groove that's in, of the duplex that's formed between the target message RNA and the microRNA here. And it makes really intimate contact with the minor groove. So it's probably easier to see from the side, moving through the surface. So you can see it makes these, it inserts these hydrophobic residues in the minor groove here. It makes almost perfect shape complement. So this led to a really nice idea in that helix 7 may be serving a proofreading function. And so the idea is this. So argon has a tricky problem. So it has to know when it's bound to the correct um, target RNA sequence, but it has to go do that independently of sequence 
because it wants me to work with the micron in any sequence. And so you can't use sequence-specific contacts to check to see if the sequence you want is right. So what it does instead, I think, is it looks at the geometry of the duplex formed between, um, between the, the target and, and, the, and the micron. And so the idea would be that if you have perfect phase pairing through the um, seed region, you then form an A-form helix, which then presents an A-form minor group with perfect docking site for helix 7. If, however, you have a mismatch or even a GU wobble base pair, the base will slide past each other that will then present a distorted minor group for helix 7. So you lose this binding site for the heat for this helix, which then the yeah, other model is would be then more likely to shift back down. And that would help displace the mispaired target RNA as well, as well as push the microRNA back into its more scanning mode, where it's just being detected or exposed. That's the that's, that's the idea for how you can do proofreading by the helix here. Right, so that's what happened in the seed region. But of course, uh, I made this big point about the major rearrangement in the three prime half of the microRNA uh, as well in target lines. I think the reason this happened. Uh, it turns out the helix 7 is actually connected to the plasma. It's a bunch of high the between the two. It's so actually move as one rigid body. So you can see, there you go. That's what it looks like. They move together. And what happens when the plasma being moved, it opens up this channel that, that's holding my, this, this half of my RNA. And so you can see it changes the surface. Here are closed. And then once the target RNA stably binds, this thing opens up. And now you have all this extra space in here. Now this part's really nice. Um, so if you look, Nucleotides 13, 14, 15, and 16, these are the supplemental region. They can supplement repression that's first mediated by the C region over here. Um, in, in the first confirmation, there are basically no two nucleotides or stack into them. They're tied over inside the protein. But once the cleft opens, now you have um, this, this RNA just it seems to just rearrange such that now the, the supplemental region here um, is now in a chemical confirmation that the Watson Crick edges. Um, well, all these stack against each other, watching your edges facing out. So it's like a second little mini seed region that forms, but only after pairing, stable pairing to, to the, the real seed. And so this is really nice because now we go, we, do, we go from a situation where originally the first confirmation we had four base pairs exposed for pairing. Now we have 11. We have the full seed region, two through eight, and then uh, it's also now 13, 14, 15, and 16. And so uh, I think the way that it works is that um, you have pairing here through the, um, through the C region here. And it turns out that this confirmation, um, so nucleotide 9 here, my right here, which is the color of white. In this confirmation, there's not actually space inside the central cleft to make a, a base pair, a 9. Um, and so I think what happens when the vast majority of time in my is targeting is that you don't actually make that base pair. The RNA actually exits um, the central uh, cleft. And then, that, that, that's enough, generally. But if you then, if you had some region of complementarity on the other side, this is the structure, this is just guessing. You then make a region of, you know, this is the model. But you can see how it fit, um, this region of pairing itself. And this is really nice, because what it does is it allows RNAs to make extensive contact to target message RNA, uh, with, while avoiding the topological problem or challenge of trying to wrap these two things around each other, because it has to have forever into the two place, inside the central cleft. Right. And so what this led to is this really nice model that we had for how Argonaut finds its sites. It's sort of a stepwise model. And the idea is, it's pretty simple, a right? stepwise model for Argonaut, is that Argonaut initially just uses the first few three or four nucleotides of the seed region to look for target sites. This is enough to tell it if there is a site there, but then, um, but not so much so it's stuck. It's, it's just the minimal you need to know if this is a work site that's worth checking. And then if there is pairing there, then it can then interrogate further the pulsing region, which can be then checked or proofread by helix 7. And then if you have it available, it's a very strong site, you can also have base pairing on the other side of this cleft in the supplement. So it's a really nice model. Of course, it's just a model, and the truth is these are static crystal structures, so you never really, I mean, you can make full ideas, but you never really know. And so of course what you want to do test it. And so, luckily, we um, established a collaboration with um, Sherman Jew, who works at um, Delft University in the Netherlands. He was uh, developing a single molecule assay for observing argonaut binding to target RNA. So the way the assay works is he immobilizes the target RNA on a surface with a device, and then the target RNA has a sci-fi die, and he enters into this uh, microfluidic chamber. Um, 
argonaut bound to a microRNA with the Psi 3 dot. And so the idea is that when the when argonaut binds to the target site, it brings the Psi 3 die to close proximity to the Psi 5 dot. And you have FRET, which you can endure by um, turf microscopy. And so a typical experiment looks something like this. This is a time trace looking at one for spot on the, on the grid. He's looking at things. So initially, there's nothing that happens. But then there's a, a, a back body <coughs> event, which is um, denoted by this large increase in fret. So this is argonaut binding, and then it falls off. So you lose it. Um, so you see the 12 time here, and then it releases, and then it comes back, and then it releases, and then it back again. So you see three binding events here um, in 80 seconds or something. And so now, once you have the assay set up, we can ask the question how does this circuit process work? And so, so this is the control, basically, the time trace. If you don't have any, I'm sorry, this is the, the micro RNA views, and this is the part of This is a lot of data, but we can walk through it. Um, and so what he found was if you didn't have any complementarity, you don't get any binding events. If you put in complementary to just three nucleotides, just the, the, the very beginning of the series, two, three, and four, you can see these very um, sh uh, very quick, but they're very clear, short-lived binding events. And then as he extended the pairing further into the seed region, the binding events got longer and longer until it had the full seed region, and then they became um, basically very long, longer than photo we don't really know, but longer than three so there's a big step that happens. And if you extend it longer, of course, you know, it, it still just stays bound. And so what you can do is you can take the average and plot the average dwell times of the combining events and plot them as a function of n. This is the number of base pairs between the microRNA and, and, and the target starting at the type 2 of the microRNA. And you can see basically it goes up um, you know, a little bit with each step, and then a huge step once you have um, the full seed. So presumably this is when helix 7 is locking in. So what's clear is that the, the dwell time, how long argonaut spends on a target site, is, is clearly dependent on the number of base pairs between the microRNA and the target. It's not enough complementarity to leave. So, but however, if you look at the binding rate, or how often did these little bindings have happened, or did these bindings happen, you can see the binding rate is independent of the number of base pairs between, um, between the target and the microRNA. Which means these little quick binding events happen just as frequently as the longer ones, and even these ones here. So it's, it's really um, supports the idea that Argonaut is searching using the first bit, and then, and then once it binds, it can um, extend the, the if, if there is complementarity, it can extend the binding that longer. And we know actually it is these these first three types. The first bit is the C B that we see in the crystal structure, because if we move the complementarity further in. The C region. So this is now um, nucleotides 5, 6, and 7, which we know are partly included by the 7. The binding rate then drops down to basically close to um, the background level, so a little bit more the background So then it does something, but it's down by order of magnitude, just by moving the data. Right, so what, I think what's really nice about this is what it means is that the model, all the, all the data are pointing to a model, but the way that Argonaut finds the target sites is basically the biological equivalent of a computational string search, which is the fastest um, way to, to find a, a, a pattern in the absence of any other information. And so you know this intuitively. I mean, I, it turns out everyone, I think most people know this intuitively. I did this experiment and with the people in my lab. I brought them into my office individually, and I gave them a word search. So this is just a collection of words that you, know, if you remember. If you have kids who go to like, you know, Red Robin and get those. When they have, and they have these things on. You have to basically find the word elephant in this jumble of words. So I gave it to every student and postdoc in the lab, and there was, it was pretty variable. So some, some people found it in two seconds, some people found it in 20 seconds. So the speed at which they find it was, was variable. But when I asked them, like, if you think back, what was the method you used to find it? They all used the same method. And that was that every one of them said, I looked for a small motif. Some looked for E, some looked for EL, some looked for PH, because that's rare. But everyone used exactly the same technique. They, they used um, that, right? So hopefully by now, you have a So it's the same method. But what's but what also what's also nice about the structure, if you think about it, so the fact that Argonaut sequesters most of the guide RNA inside of itself to avoid spurious content, I think is also really important because there is a huge penalty in terms of just time of search, if you um, spend time on non-target sites, it just slows the search down. I can illustrate this one by just change the word search to this search. 
I gave the same search to the same students after they've been trained on the first one, and they took, well, it was about, I think I timed it, it was like eight times longer on average <laughs> to find the same word in the same, on the same number of words. Um, and then the other one student that they didn't find it at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is because there are so many off targets, you get stuck. It just takes a lot longer. Yeah, okay, you got like five, four. <laughs> so well, yeah, most people can't find it that fast, but uh, you can. Right. So that so that's the idea for how Argonaut finds its target sites, the, the current model. And so that's basically um, how Argonaut gets. And so the last part I was going to talk about is just, this is much less developed, but I think it's a really interesting question. And the question is, what, is, what happens once you get Argonaut here? Because this is just a 3' UTR, right? And there's, of course, in the, con the full message RNA is much bigger. And so now you have this situation here. So this would be Argonaut to scale with a typical, this is just like a typical message RNA. So there, there would be the cap, this is the 5' UTR. The open reframe would be up sort of here, the trimming chart would be here. Here. And I don't, of course, I don't know how this is pulled up, but this is just for scale. Um, but what's amazing is that Argonaut can bind anywhere in the free time material. This little key protein, it can also, if, if you have enough binding sites and you can stop the ribosome, it can bind even here. And from any position in this, in this huge polymer, once Argonaut binds, it then can block, it can somehow interfere with initiation, which is happening with the count. It can certainly promote um, dilation, which is happening in the poly tail. And it can do that in any position in the message RNA, just this little protein here. And so I think the construction is an amazing question, how this little thing can do so many things from, from any position. And so there are some hints. Um, it's clear that if you have multiple Argonaut binding sites, um, they work together, they work better, especially if they're close together. So if they're within 40 nucleotides of each other, the two work close, two within 40 is better than two separate. So there, there's some sort of opportunity or synergistic effect. They also often appear, the most powerful sites appear not actually randomly, but generally at the end of the 3' UTR. So either near the stop codon or near the 3' or near the poly tail. But why that is known. But, the, but what's also known is that Argonaut recruits other things to the message RNA once it binds. And the, the, one of the main factors it recruits directly is this protein with a terrible, unfortunate name, TNRC6. So TNRC6 is a strange protein. It's 2,000 amino acids long, it's a big protein, and it has essentially no structure. It's a disordered protein. And so if you stretch it out for scale, compared to the message RNA, it would look something like this. And then TNRC6 binds, clearly binds the adenylases and other factors. And so the idea that the, the, the model we get from just looking at these I think together is that, well, I don't know how the message RNA is. They may they probably circularize in some kind of that. But it doesn't really matter because from no matter anywhere, TNRC6 is long and flexible enough to reach basically anywhere in the So maybe Argon just brings this thing in, and then this, and then TRC6, just by proximity, can bring these things together. So that's the, the, the model we're working with. But, so we're attacking it, but it's, it's hard. So the first question we ask is just how does uh, this interaction be? How does Argon recruit TRC6? So, um, so this is a schematic of primary sequence of TRC6, and what turns out is the first half, thousand amino acids here, is this GW domain, which has been shown by many groups to bind Argon. And so if you look at the primary sequence, it's, it's predicted to be completely disordered. And there's no motif that you can recognize. The only thing that's clear is the preponderance of lysines, blue Gs, and tryptophan, um, these red Ws. But apart from that, there's no clear motifs. I mean, sometimes you can see GWG, GWG, but then there's Ws that don't have Gs, or G's only Gs on some side. So there's lots of Gs, there's lots of Ws. But there's, looking at it, staring at it, there's nothing really obvious that comes out. And yet we know, um, several of have shown that the tryptophans are important for binding argon. It's also curious to have the most hydrophobic residue and disordered from over over again. So we asked a very simple question, is does argonaut bind tryptophan? And the answer was yes. So we crystallized the protein in the presence of three tryptophans, the amino acids. We saw right away that the presence of tryptophan changed the way the crystal grew. So we thought that was a good, a good sign. And now we've gone back and done many structures with different, in different crystal um, different space groups, and we found is that there are three tryptophan binding sites in the bottom of the PV domain in Argonaut. And so this is basically as far away from the action of the RNA attack here as possible. And so if you zoom in, what you can see is these three tryptophan binding sites all sit adjacent to each other in pockets. Um, and you can see that move the surface representation. 
sort of roll around. This is site, we named this one site three that we found the last. This is the first site we found, site one, and then this is site two. But what's important is that in each case, the tryptophan is always bind with the indole side, um, side chain pointing into the protein, and then um, the methane atom pointing out. So it's conceivable that all of these amino acids would be bound to a single polypeptide chain. And so what would that mean that it would look something like this? You know, how the structure is. So we can imagine a polypeptide chain would then have to traverse around um, strips of argon and look something like that. And so we have an idea, okay, maybe argon binds like this, this Part we can't see, but we haven't done it yet. But then you can ask the question, okay, if you were to measure from these different sites, measuring around the protein from here to here is about 25 angstroms, and then from here to here is about 25 angstroms. And so what that means is, if you really were to do this, you would need a flexible linker um, from here to here of about 8 to 14 flexible residues, and then the same thing here, depending on how flexible that sort of decent point. I don't know that it's So then you can ask the question, okay, great. Can we find any motifs? We have tryptophan separated by this by this distance. Now you go back to the primary sequence, which appeared to be totally random at first, but now it turns out if you look for this motif, it's it's, it's really weird. It's it's not perfect there. It's not always exactly tan nucleotides. There's no pattern you can see, but statistically, it's the, this the spacing is um, highly overrepresented from what you expect by chance. And so it kind of fits with the idea. So basically, now you have these. Sort of two in this case, a lot of isoforms, but in this case, for two wraps of these evenly spaced, semi evenly spaced tryptophan And so that's kind of where we are at the model. Oh, yeah, so we asked the question um, do these things, are they involved in binding, um, um, are these tryptophan binding sites involved in interaction with TRP6? And so we've looked at this, and I think the answer is yes. We looked at a lot of different ways. It's, it's, it's hard to do the experiments. The first thing we did is just co express the two proteins um, in, in two nitrate cells. Express argonaut and express TRNT6, pull down argonaut by IP, and then do a western block of TRNT6. We do that, we do a flag, A02, we pull down the flag, and you can see plot body for TRNT6. The wild type argonaut, you see the band. There's a negative control, there was a, um, a, a mutant in argonaut, it was known not to bind TRNT6. It actually turned out to be a mutation right between site 1 and site 2, um, which is here, and so that's good, it's kind of loose it a little, little bit of binding. Then we had our own mutations in, in the sites, trying to basically disrupt the hydrophobic character of the site. We mutate site one, we lose the IP. We mutate site three, we lose the IP. But site two, we mutate this, I don't know, breaking it or it's just not important. When we mutate site two binding site, um, it doesn't seem to interfere with the IP. But there's other assays. Um, this, this part's still in development, but, um, it, but it's good. So we, there's another assay you can look at, and this is looking more inside the cell. It's less direct than this is happening inside the cell. The idea is for this assay, you make a renilla luciferase reporter, and you can put in the 3' ETR these box D hairpins, which will bind this land and peptide. So you can make, you can basically directly tether your argonaut protein to your reporter. And the idea would be that if argonaut is functional, it will then recruit TRNC6, which will then repress um, the, the reporter. And that's it. So it's a nice luciferase. And so this totally works, um, and we didn't develop this as well. Um, so basically, if you Tethered the wild type argonaut to the um, reporter, you get about fourfold repression, which is sort of micro RNA like. If you take any one of those um, tryptophan binding sites, you see about half the repression goes away. And if you mutate any, any combination of two sites, except for this, so we can site one and site two, you lose not all of it. But anything, anytime you take site three with any other, then it goes basically back to baseline and triple the four sets of activity. And so it looks like all three sites contribute, but there's something. Combinations seem to matter. And then, um, right. And so the model is argonaut binds here, you know, it binds the site, it, and then so it binds to the island and recruits TRC6 to so this little tryptophan island. And then, um, right, that brings in the analysis and other factors, whatever. You know, it does. And then, so give another argonaut nearby, it's supposed to, to bind to another tryptophan island. Um, and then that will then, you know, just through affinity help the binding. This is totally happening, but this is where we are. Right, and then you have another argonaut up here, which um, may interact with the separate terms of six, or it could actually help to bring things together. So basically now you bring all the factors together right, because all these triple islands are um, within proximity of each other. Of course, if you look, this is where it gets kind of crazy. We only have three um, argonauts found here, but count them with bands. here. The other six can easily accommodate seven or ten. So there are probably some unsatisfied. 
So you could, in principle, have another RNA protein bound to a distinct different message RNA, which would then have maybe another RNA, which could bring in another TNRC6. And once you do that, now it's kind of game on, right? Because you can just keep going and build up this massive sort of uh, repressive conglomerate. Which, um, but, but this is nice because in this situation, it doesn't matter where RNA is relative to anything because everything is just being brought together inside itself. And so it seems maybe a little bit crazy, but it, there is some evidence for something like this happening. Because if you look at mammalian cells, um, TNRC6 localizes to these discrete bodies, these GW bodies. Um, so this is the HeLa cell here, and this is named for TNRC6. This was shown a long time ago, probably a decade ago. Argonaut co-localizes. You can see that's Argonaut shown here. Really co-localizes. So we did, we mutated the tryptophan binding site. So the sound is mutating any one site, you still see co-localization. But it's, it, it, and, then it, and then also, if you take site one and site two together, you still see co-location, which is similar to what we saw. We still see repression in, the, uh, in our report assay. But anytime you mutate site three to any of the other two, um, then you lose um, co-localization. And of course, the triple, triple mutant does. And then we, I should say, we tested the argon proteins otherwise perfectly fine. They bind microRNAs. They have all the other activities. So the mutants are very, very, try hard to be very careful not to just mess with the protein. So that leads to the, the summary. So basically, there's really only two ideas. Um, and the first is the uh, most of the talks about this, the way Argonaut seems to find the sites, its target sites, is this sort of stepwise pro process, which probably is the, the fastest and best way to do it. Um, and then the second idea is that we're working on multivalent interactions with the United States can lead to this sort of sequestering of target RNAs, and then from there, repression can, can ensue. But we're still totally. And so I'll end by my acknowledgments. Um, all the work I, I talked about today was done by, my lab was done by a graduate student, Nikki you surely who defended um, two days ago. Um, so she's about to graduate with Vaughn, and then another graduate student, um, Jess. And then, of course, the, the collaborators, um, Sherman and Stanley, did all seem along the work. And I'll just stop there. And, um, There's definitely something sequence dependent. You, 
can get sometimes a tenfold or even more increase from just that one base term, which doesn't dramatically seem to add up. But I, I imagine there is, it's basically allowing argonaut to go into some more stable confirmation, something subtle that it's going to be a, a while. Oh, well, you know. as, far, as far as hitting DNA, it'd be interesting to test it. But argonaut based, I, well, I guess sometimes there's evidence that goes in the nucleus. Yeah, I don't know if it. How, much, how often I encounter single-stranded DNA. I'm not even aware of how much single-stranded DNA there is in the eukaryote itself, but I, I, I still doubt it. You know, Carver submitted this experiment 20 years ago. Honoring DNA nucleus is most stable. So once it said it's sometimes more stable than honoring, 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 The best we could do is just see if it binds and see if it is our kind of changes the DNA. It seems like it, yeah. I mean, um, the ostrate, oh, from the arm of the argonaut or leave the microRNA? I don't think it's, I, I think that's exceeding.
that's the best evidence that we have for this sort of scanning. And once it engages, it seems to stay associated. It doesn't miss the next one. If it slides that way, find it. But if it's rolling or scanning or hopping, it's not, you know. But it scans in both directions. Yeah, it just goes back and forth. Yeah, it just goes back and forth until it falls.